so so welcome um, uh, to those who've managed to to get through the uh, through cyberspace uh, to us. Um, uh, my name is Phil Cohen. I'm the research director of uh, Lumimax Network, and I was one of the team that um, uh, put together this groundbreakers uh, trail and guide. Um, and I'm delighted uh, this evening that uh, two other members of the team, uh, Toby Butler and Jonathan Gardner, uh, are joining me. And we're going to um, unpack some of the some of the, the issues we we worked through in putting the guide together from, from our different uh, perspectives. Uh, I'm an ethnographer. John is an archaeologist, and Toby is a, a public historian. So um, you're going to get sort of three takes on 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 the project uh, from us um, so I, what I thought uh, just say also a couple of housekeeping things um, I've been, we've enabled the uh, transcription uh, uh, mechanism uh, and also the, uh, the the event is being uh, recorded um, and we'll be putting up a kind of an edited version of it on our website um, after this. And uh, the other events, this is the last event in the launch program uh, for uh, Groundbreakers, um, which includes a number of uh, walks and also um, some, uh, some uh, webinar discussions. Um, so yes, all of those, if you've missed any of the other ones, uh, you can find uh, 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 the videos, uh, video link on our, on our website. So please do that if you, if you want to look at those. Um, but I thought we'd, we'd start. Um, uh, Toby, if you could um, take that right. Yeah. Um, I thought we'd start just by looking at a, a, a very short film uh, that was made um, with a rather interesting soundtrack um, about, uh, well, I think we'll just, we'll just play it and then we'll maybe have some things to say about that. Valley begins here at Hackney Wick, and I think it ends at Walthamstow somewhere. Everything's basically under Lee Valley. Lee Valley bike riding, Lee Valley ice skating, Lee Valley swimming. We just call it the Wick, or up the Wick, the Wick. Lee Valley, if someone said to me Lee Valley, I would think of the ice skating ring and places like that. But round here, we just call it the Wick, yeah. People may not know the name, but this is where the Vikings were repelled and the first paper mills were built. It's the birthplace of the technological revolution. Yeah, it's like you're expected to be in different parts and things like that, but to come just up the road from where you live in Hackney Wick, that's something to be proud of. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm interested in the Olympics. On my doorstep, I'll be there watching it. I will. The Olympics will change this part of London. It's inevitable. Something's got to change around here. The only thing I would love to see here, and I don't know if it's ever going to work, is signs for dogs. You do, do hear that Dick Turpin used to roam down here. And before the war, we used to have sheep on the marsh.
Okay, well, I, I just thought it'd be interesting to, that it was some, in, something to say about that, actually, about that little, um, it's a link to a promo, I think, for, a, for, the, for this rather dreamy soundtrack. Um, I think what's interesting about it is that it, it combines a kind of anticipated nostalgia for, for what's about to, to be lost um, with a, a fatalistic, well, in one case, rather enthusiastic acceptance of, of its inevitability. Something has to change around here. Uh, one of the residents commented um, uh, over an image of industrial dereliction. Um, and one of the things I think we, we, we wanted to challenge, actually, one of the things we wanted to do in Groundbreakers is to challenge the public perception which is shared by quite a lot of locals, as well as the Olympic delivery authorities, that the area was a wasteland awaking re reclamation. Um, and that's, in a sense, one of the, one of the, the points that we wanted to kind of engage with. Um, but equally, uh, the area wasn't inhabited by such a vibrant community and economy that the building of the Olympic Park could be considered an act of vandalism. So that was the kind of more kind of if you like, a lymphophobic sort of response to that. Uh, what interested me as an ethnographer, I mean, someone who's actually worked um, with communities in East London over a long period of time, um, was the often complicated and ambivalent attitudes that different groups adopted in response to the advent of Olympics on their doorstep. Right. Uh, this is a, a shot of the, from the Olympic opening ceremony, if you might remember, of the, uh, the Industrial Revolution happening. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so, so much of the, what I'm trying to do in the book is to give a slightly wider angled view of, uh, to understand um, people's responses to the Olympics in terms of a sense of the wider social geography and cultural history of the area. Um, and I was also interested in how the work, work, workforce that was assembled to, to build the, the park and its venues, how they related to the Olympic project. I mean, was it just another job or were they actually caught up in the whole kind of rhetoric of the, the Olympics and the sort of civic boosterism that went with it? Um, now, whether so, so I so I spent a lot of time, you know, listening to, to people, you know, talking to me and said focus groups, and and uh, I did this project on the Olympic Park with the workforce. Um, and one of the things that struck me was that the kinds of stories people told, whether they were residents or or, or the workers, uh, depended very much on whether they felt they had a kind of stake uh, in the Olympic project. It could be an actual, an actual material stake. It could be something a bit more symbolic. It could be a political or personal stake, but how far they had a sense of that, a sense of ownership, um, was, was important. And also, um, whether they saw the whole sort of regeneration as a process, in which case, if it's a process, then it has, um, it has some continuity to it, but it also, has, it also has, it comes to an end. So it has a beginning and an end, you know, so it's kind of finite. Um, or whether they saw it as a sort of one-off event, uh, in which case, uh, you know, that kind of implies that the Olympics was a kind of created a rupture, a kind of discontinuity with the past. Um, and I think uh, that distinction, whether you see it as a, as a process or an event, um, carries over um, into the narrative legacy of, of the games. In other words, the collective memory scapes that came to be fashioned around 2012 and which continue to inflect and influence how people see uh, what's happening on Olympic Park today. Um, so, for, so really what, what concerned me was whether local residents or the park workforce um, regarded themselves as in, in the language of Olympic games changers. In other words, their presence and participation actively affected uh, the outcome or did they feel they were merely they merely had a walk on part in a drama that was essentially being a stage stage for other people's entertainment and benefit and profit? So did they feel they were actively making history, um, or were they merely its passive subjects with little or no control uh, either over the immediate events or, or or the longer term process of change? And I want to look at uh, look at that. Um, uh, drawing on the work I did on the Olympic site during the initial demolish, dig and design phase of the construction. Um, so, just so, oh, well, here's, here's just a nice little quote, uh, which I'll, I'll maybe come back to. 
Um, perhaps you can just uh, scan it while I'm I'm chuntering on. Um, uh, so I, re I really wanted to, to look at how um, during that phase, um, which involved uh, taking down the electricity pylons, which I'll, uh, that's, that was the name they give to the initial construction phase or destruction phase. So the electricity pylons that surrounded the site were, were all um, taken down. Um, and the power lines uh, were undergrounded in two tunnel tunnels, which ran from north to south across the site. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time uh, uh, with the tunnelers and also the surface workers uh, during that phase of the um, building, building the, the park. So you had a, a very dramatic visual process, the taking down of the, uh, um, of the, of the pylons and also the demolition of some of the extant buildings. This is Clay's Lane Estate, uh, which uh, uh, housed uh, a large number of, of young people, students, people on low incomes and so on, um, and as a housing cooperative, and that was uh, demolished with uh, obviously some considerable housing loss um, involved in that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, that, so that's been my focus. Um, so you had this combination of a very dramatic visual change, but also in terms of the tunneling, the tunnel has been built this completely invisible, hidden uh, process. Uh, and in a sense, that two sides of it uh, became a central theme of groundbreakers. The relationship between, uh, if you like, the labor history of the site and its environmental history and how that, that played together in what we might call the archaeology of the present, which I think probably Johnny is going to also talk, talk, talk about. Um, so just to go back to the, um, the previous quote, um, it's interesting that um, you've got this idea of digging around in archives, you know, unearthing hidden material. And, and then at the same time, you've got this, um, more archaeological notion of uncovering objects and artifacts that were buried uh, in the landscape. And I think those two kinds of activities turn out to have quite a lot in common. Um, and, and one way of understanding that um, has been uh, uh, taking a leaf out of, out of Hegel's uh, notion of the mole of history. So he identified the mole of history um, as an agent of the human spirit, burrowing a way to create the conditions of progress and then Marx came along and gave it a sharper, more materialist uh, edge um, to the activity of this, uh, this particular quitter. And his quote was, he, what he said was, we recognize our old friend, our old mole, who knows so well how to work underground and then suddenly to emerge and transform the world. Um, so you have those, that two, two sides to the notion of excavation and the, the mole is a kind of figure or metaphor for doing that. Uh, and then Walter Benjamin actually made that uh, much more explicit uh, in the quote uh, that you've got there. Um, and, you know, he said, well, just read the last, last bit of that. So in the same way as a good archaeological report not only informs us about the strata from which findings originate, but also gives an account of the strata which first had to be broken through. So it's important that the investigator marks quite precisely the site where memories surface and not simply provide an inf inventory of the contents. Uh, and maybe um, uh, Johnny will have something more to kind of add to that. Okay, uh, so I want to start just by um, looking at how the uh, construction process was re re represented um, from, from the top down, as it were. Um, and this is probably quite a good example of that. Um, this was a, a publicity still that was issued uh, about 2007, where there's five years to go to the, um, the opening of the Olympics. And, uh, you know, you've got this kind of choreography of the, of the, of the workforce, you know, um, who really, uh, well, they're there uh, as kind of, they're, they're the hard hats, you know. Um, and then, of course, you've got uh, uh, said Lord Coe in the middle in his, uh, his, in his suit. Um, you know, who's the, who's the master of ceremonies. But I mean, it's a representation of the workforce really as almost kind of anonymous hard hats. Um, and that's uh, one version of the top down, uh, you know, vision of, of the Olympics. And of course the whole delivery process of the Olympics was very top down. 
And the other thing they did was that they installed a, a camera on, on top of uh, one of the housing, uh, social housing estates overlooking uh, the Olympic site. And indeed, the offices of, uh, of, of uh, the ODA and LOCOG uh, similarly had this, you look, you know, you go up there on the, on the 28th floor, what it was, and they, well, you could actually see, um, see this uh, the site as it was developing. And they used time-lapse photography uh, uh, to record uh, the whole kind of um, process uh, of, of, of the, of the build-out. Um, so you saw these cranes pirouetting, old buildings falling down apparently of their own accord, new ones getting erected in their place, while the human ants run around distractedly in seemingly unrelated patterns uh, uh, of behaviour on the ground. So in a way, it was ironically a kind of rather graphic illustration of Marx's theory of alienation, you know, that they went to work with the kind of feel that they're kind of extruded from, the, from their own work process and what they're building, you know, it, 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 it dominates them uh, from outside. And on top of that was Labour's commentary about uh, incremental progress, how there was this determination to meet targets and over, overcome all obstacles. So the, the aim of this kind of way of representing, um, you know, building the park was an attempt to um, demonstrate its epic scale, but what was missing was any account of what any of that meant to those who worked on the site. Um, and what my work did was, I suppose, uh, try to show how uh, important the, the place was to, to the workforce as a, as a place of memory, as a memory scape, as a source of shared stories, and in some cases, a ritually imagined world. So what I want to do then is, is try and um, uh, uh, go back to 2007-8 uh, uh, and uh, listen to uh, what the, the work, workforce itself had to say. Now, I was hoping to actually have uh, been able to have clips of the actual interviews I did. Unfortunately, I'm afraid you probably gathered my technological skills in this matter are not very great, and I, I couldn't actually get the, uh, the actual live interviews. So I've had to, uh, have to, had to quote uh, from them. So I'm not going to read these quotes out because that would be substituting, that would be impersonating um, the workforce. Now, some of us don't do that, right? We create a platform in which people can speak and actually tell their stories. So I'm going to ask you just simply to, to, to read down these quotes, um, maybe concentrating this case in the, in the second paragraph. Um, so I'm going to just pause for a moment uh, while you do that. So Kevin McManus was uh, um, one of the chief uh, civil engineers on, uh, on, on this phase of the project. Um, and people often say that, you know, um, miners, tunnels and people like that really don't have any sense of the, of, of the environmental uh, uh, impact that their work has. And I think here you can see that in fact they do. Um, they have a very, very direct and material sense of their interaction with, with the physical environment. Um, and, you know, are indeed active environmentalists in that sense. Um, th this shows the, the two tunnels that were built um, across the, underneath the park. Um, now, um, History often proceeds by its bad side, um, often under the guise of modernization or progress. But um, I, want, I think we want to, I want to bring it onto the stage, if you like, somebody whose job was to make sure that nothing bad happened. History proceeds by its bad side, but he's, this is this guy, uh, Bill Chappell, who was the chief health and safety engineer on the site. There he is, uh, among the tunnels. And, uh, this is what he had to say. Bill was a West Ham supporter, actually, um, as well as uh, being a fan, an addict of disaster movies. I asked him what he did in his spare time. He said, I watch disaster movies. 
Um, and actually, Towering Inferno was, was his favorite movie. Um, I think one thing we can be certain of is if, um, if, if Bill and people like him had been listened to, Grenfell Tower would never have happened. Um, but that, that, was his, uh, that was his take on, on the whole thing. Um, now, of course, the thing is that the, the fact that the, the, the site was, was so contaminated um, was, was a kind of key, key theme throughout the, the whole of, of this phase of the, of the project. In fact, the, the whole uh, project had to be stopped for several days when um, the tunnel boring machine ran into an unmapped underground store of toxic chemicals. Um, and, and the tunnel had to be evacuated. I mean, fortunately, nobody was, uh, was badly affected by it. Um, and again, um, the way that, that that event and and the kind of risks associated were talked about uh, uh, actually differed. A lot of the the tunnelers um, sort of normalised it. Um, uh, you know, it was just um, it was a risky job, uh, and and such events were all par for the course. But then, of course, others uh, saw, uh, you know, hitting such, such a, a toxic site underground as a, as a sort of significant historical moment, revealing the kind of like the long duration of the Anthropocene and the human war against nature. So, so uh, you know, there was another kind of narrative that came into play around that. Um, the toxic traces of another kind of war were also much in evidence. So. Um, while I was doing the field work, there was persistent rumours amongst the surface workers about an unexploded bomb from World War II. Um, and again, I mean, obviously, uh, very few people there would have um, you know, would been alive in, in, in the war. This is just to show the, the tunnel boring machine in action. And this is a, a key moment, actually, in the whole tunnelling process, uh, the breakthrough when, when uh, the tunnel boring machine you know, comes from both ends of the tunnel. And there has to be this amazingly precise um, calculation that the, the two parts of the tunnel meet up and you get this kind of breakthrough. And this is what's happening here. And um, uh, uh, so this, this guy here is uh, going to bring a quote from him on in a minute. Um, Sean McCusker. Uh, McCusker. Um, so here's his comment on, on that whole process. Um, so the sort of shadow of the Second World War was sort of haunted, was hang over the whole uh, the whole project, and kind of ironic in a way because the whole the whole rhetoric of uh, uh, of this phase was you know you know. Building, you know, its transformation, uh, build, you know, building into the future, uh, this kind of positive aspirational sort of rhetoric uh, that was mobilised around around the whole Olympics, uh, including this phase of the building the park. And yet, uh, for those people who are actually working there, uh, this this idea of this kind of uh, lethal presence of of, of an unexploded bomb it dramatised it. Um, uh, was very much uh, on their minds. And um, in fact, a lot of them, uh, in, in the Second World War, of course, uh, a lot of, uh, in, the, in the bomb sites, kids used to go around collecting shrapnel. And a lot of the surface workers actually did the same thing. I mean, all those years later, because they unearthed bits of shrapnel and I think somebody found, found a, um, a gas mask uh, somewhere. So, you know, there were these kind of material traces of, of the Second World War that uh, were, were all around. Um, on the other hand, that wasn't the only findings. Uh, uh, as, uh, as Sean said, there were other, um, other things that people found uh, that had uh, ha happier associations uh, and, and helped to create a, a much more positive uh, memory scape. Um, and this is illustrated by um, stories that were told me by this father and son te a rigger team. The rigger, rig, riggers were, uh, they usually worked, uh, they're self-employed, they have this rig, they bore holes in, in, in the ground to take soil samples, which are sent to the laboratory, uh, which enable the people who are planning the whole kind of tunneling process to know exactly um, uh, you know, what the tunneling, the, the tunnel boring machine is, is actually going to uh, encounter. 
Um, and uh, they were, uh, and particularly uh, 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 Mark, the, the dad, uh, was a real scavenger. He spent a lot of his spare time on the site actually scavenging around for, for stuff. And they did find a lot of stuff. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, Gary showing one of one of their finds, uh, but they found all sorts of um, bits and pieces. Uh, and since they'd visited lots of sites in, in the course of, of their work, uh, they had a collection of Roman coins um, and all sorts of other things. So they were kind of amateur archaeologists, right? As well as uh, amateur geologists. Of course, they also knew a lot about the kind of soil and, and the geology of the site as well. Um, so um, this was, uh, I did these interviews with them and uh, one part of this uh, with, uh, with a son, with, uh, with Gary, uh, was actually used by the, um, the uh, local uh, on, on one of their posters. So he's quite chuffed about that. Um, I mean, it's not often that actually the workforce got their voices um, and their stories actually told as part of the Olympic story. So this is an example of actually that actually happening. Um, but I'm going to fin end on this. Um, uh, Gary, uh, um, um, uh, Mark uh, made a, a, a map, uh, customized the uh, Monopoly map as a, as a present to his son for his 18th birthday. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can, you can probably see that he's renamed um, all the sites and it, each of the sites has a story and the story is about something that happened um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the park, on the, on the Olympic Park uh, during this phase of the construction. Um, so, so really it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a map, it's a kind of aid memoir. Uh, it's a good piece of memorabilia for us, uh, 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 Mark said, and uh, uh, it was something that he, he kind of quite consciously thought that we're going to be looking back on this event, and this is going to help us help us to remember um, all the events, all the relationships, all the people um, that we met. So this is an example of you know people who are themselves creating their own memory scape, their own if you like landscape of meaning, which is quite quite different from the kind of official narrative that the the Olympic uh, was being beamed down on the site from the top down. Um, so um, uh, each site then has a, has a little narrative uh, a, attached to it. Um, and I only have time just to look at one or two. Um, I thought this was interesting because um, they, uh, they renamed Whitehall on the, on the uh, Monopoly bat map uh, they re renamed it the Lying Tongue. So I thought that was quite an interesting comment. It's both a comment on, on you know, how they perceive Whitehall and particularly all these uh, governments. Um, uh, the Olympic site was, had the workforce, but it was full of uh, uh, mainly men with clipboards running around, observing, taking notes. Um, and, and the workforce actually got quite oppressed by this kind of heavy sort of top-down regulation and they kind of associate that with these kind of civil servants who knew nothing about tunneling or, or construction processes um, but were just concerned that they, they could be mapped onto their kind of bureaucratic um, kind of map of what was supposed to be happening. So he, uh, he renames White, Whitehall um, um, the, the Lion Tongue and then, then, then uh, puts in a very sort of story about a uh, uh, family history, family story uh, about, uh, about, about that. Um, and um, so, he, so he went around the whole, uh, the whole of the Olympic site, uh, renaming it uh, according to, um, to different, uh, different stories they wanted to remember. Uh, I, I'm going to end on this. Um, so this was one of the um, one of the people that they got to know, uh, Aidan, who was um, uh, involved uh, in the kind of bomb, well, he was a kind of bomb disposal expert. Um, and, and they brought these people onto the site because they, they were indeed worried that there was um, a, an unexploded bomb there somewhere. Um, and I think, uh, is it that one? Yes, I think it's that one. Um, so they obviously reckon this guy, although, although 
he seemed strange to them. I mean, he came from a different sort of background, I guess. Um, uh, but, but they were very interested in the fact that he came from this sort of military background and, uh, uh, you know, he, he had this very important role. Um, and he ends up by, you know, by saying that um, people don't pay enough respect uh, and attention to what people like this, you know, what jo the job they do. And uh, I mean, their, their stories and their view of the world. So, you know, this is an example, I think, then, of, uh, of really using this kind of approach, this kind of ethnographic approach, does create a space in which these stories, and a time in which these stories can be told, and which a different perspective on, on, uh, on what's happening uh, can, be, uh, can be registered and, uh, and also remembered. Um, and against the sort of triumphalism, and uh, which this was a poster put out by the mayor of um, Newham, who I think thought that Newham had won the games. Um, and uh, this was a, the theory, everyone's a winner. Um, so there was this sort of civic triumphalism going on about the Olympics. Um, and I think it's important to have some kind of counter narrative to that, uh, which is what really what this project and what ethnography generally tries to do. And just to conclude, I think um, we need to, um, we need to think about, about creating a kind of sense of history, which I think the quote Raymond Williams makes uh, hope uh, convincing or more convincing than despair. Um, it, it's much easier to create sort of dystopic visions of you know what's what's going what's coming down the line with uh, global heating. And in fact, I did um, end. Uh, I, I started my book on the Olympics uh, with this. Uh, commission this image, um, and uh, I'll just finish by reading uh, this opening uh, paragraph. Um, but with the proviso that we need to move on from this, it's it's in a way too easy to conjure up this kind of dystopic vision of, of the future. We need to produce a history that gives us reason to hope. Anyway, I'll finish with this. As evening grew on, we went to what was left of Tower Bridge to watch the Paralympic dream marvelling at the flickering figures as they vaulted over the sandbag parapets in their giant wheelchairs. Our gaze was inevitably drawn downriver to the famous motto, Amplius Charius Colossicus, written in neon lipstick against the city's darkening rim. It was time to visit the Olympic Park and sample the remainder glory of the games. We hired a gondola at the Isle of Dogs, and as we approached the site, we were overwhelmed by the awesome spectacle of the orbital tower, now leaning more crazily than ever Pisa's did, this noxious weeds cling to its superstructure, <laughs> creating a veritable hanging garden of London Babylon. So um, I started the book with that, but I, I ended it on, on a more hopeful uh, note. And I think, I think uh, that in a sense, when we think about what ethnography can bring to the party, I think it's a more grounded sense of the present, um, but also a, a sense that um, its relationship to the past and the future uh, is still in play. It's not something that's, that, that is fixed. It's not something that, we, that certainly should be foreclosed. Um, and that therefore it's something that creates a space for, for further debate, for ne further negotiation and further interpretation. Um, and I think Groundbreakers in a way, what we try to do in this project is uh, you know, create uh, both through the guide and the uh, the trail, uh, more food for thought. So I'll end it there. Lovely, thanks, Phil. Um, right, uh, if you could, I, I'm going to share my screen. I, I am share. Let me just do this. Yeah, there we go. Phil, do you want to take some questions now, or, or do you want to leave it till the end? We'll leave it to the end, I think. Okay. All right. That's great. Wow. Okay. How do I follow that? Um, yeah. Well, well, my name's Toby Butler. Um, as well as authoring some of the content for the um, trail and uh, the website and so on, um, I was also responsible for project managing the design, uh, both of the website and the other resources. Um, so what I'm going to do as a kind of counterpoint to Phil is discuss sort of perhaps more of the practical kind of issues of 
uh, public history and creating public history, <clears throat> you know, when you're confronted by a huge wealth of material um, collected by people like Phil and, you know, the, some of these uh, 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 interview materials um, and the um, digging account that you've just heard made its way in, into the guide. But Phil wasn't the only one working on this. Um, we had a, a, a teams of, of students and, and senior volunteers who visited local and national archives um, to find information out about the site itself alongside various expert writers and academics. Now, if this was a film and I could roll the credits, you know, at the end where you can see, you know, all of those extraordinary list of people that were involved, um, I think the sheer number of people in creating the content might surprise you. At least 30 people were directly involved in researching and creating content for this. And if you count the various website authors that we contacted, the archivists that helped us find resources, the school children and graduate students who helped us develop the augmented reality trail, we'd probably be looking at upwards of 50 people. Now, if I push this point even further to include people whose work is presented in a new context, the photographers, for example, of the uh, archive images that we used in the project, the authors of the reports and the books and the articles that we drew on, um, and the people that we directly quoted, we would now be looking at well over 200 people who could justifiably claim to have some practical, creative or intellectual contribution to this guide and the website. So these 200 people are what Raphael Samuel called the invisible hands that co-create works uh, of, of public history and, and in fact, um, all history. Um, but I think it's worth just pausing for a moment to reflect on what an extraordinary collective art creating place-based history like this is. For the rest of this talk, I'd like to draw back the curtain a little bit on that process of distillation um, that's involved when you're drawing on sort of so many different sources for, 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 for work like this and explore some of the ways that we've endeavoured to make a thoughtful public history that embraces the complex multi-layered nature of the site. And, and, we, and obviously, you know, we're in, in any, any publicly focused work, you're trying to make it accessible and understandable, but you're trying not to kind of oversimplify uh, even though that is completely inevitable in, 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 in all kind of a public uh, 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 focus work, including academic writing, actually. But, but I'll just start by explaining just some of the key decisions that we made in the creation of the online map and the guide and take you through some of the themes that we chose to explore. And when I take you through those themes, I've just, got, I've just picked out a highlight or, or a key example from each that just, just gives a sense of the different conceptual approaches we, 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 we took from a historical geographical approach. Now, one of the first struggles that we have in creating any kind of historic guide, particularly one that spans uh, two millennia, is how to make it digestible. And, and usually this involves working in some kind of narrative, and in publishing that's usually done by writing thematic chapters in a book. But when you're dealing with digital storytelling, it's not so easy, particularly when you're dealing with location-based material organised on a map. On digital maps, the user can click around wherever they like, uh, and also we're dealing with a park um, and we wanted this to work uh, in some way uh, in the park itself on mobile devices. And then we have an additional problem that the, uh, the, the park user can come in from one of, of dozens of, of different sides of the park and we'll be doing the material um, in a different order. Um, so this makes, uh, makes it pretty, pretty difficult to kind of to have any kind of narrative thread really um, through, uh, through map-based through map material. However, maps can be wonderful spaces for carrying historical material. History Pin, for example, Layers of London uh, are perhaps the most user-friendly uh, and well-known platforms for this in the uh, London context. And they're fantastic examples of citizen-generated historical mapping. But when there's too many pins or it's mixed up with too many themes, it can quickly become quite overwhelming. And we also felt that very brief material, which is so common on Google map entries, simply didn't have the depth ne necessary to convey things uh, or, to, or to convey enough of the complexity of the various forces at work in the history of the park site. So we therefore explored pla map platforms that would be comfortable to browse, but also could cope thematically with in-depth and quite lengthy textual material. So we ended up using StoryMap.js. This is a free platform. It was developed in, in the States by Northwestern University. And um, it we came across it from Liverpool Museums, who had just started to use this for some place-based projects on, on slavery. 
Now, story maps could, ac could accommodate introductory material. Um, and as you can see, quite lengthy text, with, um, which you can scroll down, um, which meant that we could introduce a theme. And also it had the flexibility to be explored by clicking on the map icons uh, like Google Maps, or you could do it in a particular narrative order by using the arrow keys, uh, which appear on, on, on either side um, of the screen. So let me just demonstrate this. I'm just going to move, move to the website itself. Okay, so here we are. Uh, this is a story map, and you can see um, we're on the whole map here. And you've got a, you know, a kind of higgledy piggledy collection of 32 um, icons here, any of which you could tap on uh, and go straight to um, that particular story. Uh, but notice at the top here, we also decided to go with a thematic uh, route. Um, and that meant that we could have, you know, uh, a, an introduction, um, which uh, Phil um, basically uh, uh, um, wrote, um, but then we could link the various points that, you know, that, that we felt kind of spoke to that particular theme. So the, um, the you know, the user could kind of have a, a much kind of more um, in-depth or, or, or sustained uh, engagement, you know, um, with some of the wider patterns and ideas. Uh, rather than a, a bitty experience of, of clicking around um, a furry crowded um, Google map. Um, now there are there were some downsides to this approach and downsides to using story map. The main one is that if you click on any of these points um, or you click on the arrows um, to move through uh, the story as it were, uh, the problem is that I can't actually link directly to this article, okay? The, the, um, the web address is exactly the same for this entire map. And in fact, actually, this is five separate maps uh, which David Dorrington, our designer, um, had to create to make this work. So these are, these are five completely different maps and five completely um, different um, uh, web uh, pages, but it just, just kind of makes um, referencing kind of individual uh, um, elements difficult and, and it, which isn't a problem that you get you know, using a more popular platforms. However, it's what the lovely thing about it is that you can embed it on, on, any, on any website. And, um, and we decided that we wanted it embedded on the Living Maps website, primarily because it's something that we knew we could maintain uh, for, you know, uh, for, for, for many, many years, um, which can be a serious problem with you know, when you're creating just project based websites that are only funded for two or three years and, and they just disappear into ether. Okay, um, so before I go back to the presentation, uh, I just uh, want to draw your attention to the resources pages. So um, and please do you know, ha have a look around this, uh, this site if you haven't done so already. But we've also got the, the PDF uh, guidebook here. We thought that was important for people that don't want to click around a map and would much prefer um, a written guide. So that's, that's over 100 pages and includes all of the content that's, um, that we created. We've also got an augmented reality trail, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and some teaching resources. Uh, again, I'll mention this a little bit later on. So just so you know, um, that, that there's some other kind of quite important elements of the project which are hidden away under that resources button. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So in the past, there was a tendency for some local historians to envisage places as very fixed, bordered and defined with specific somehow intrinsic character that emerges over time. Recently work by historic and cultural geographers has challenged this conception and argued that places are subjects of, to all kinds of flows and trajectories and shifting patterns of nature, power, culture and capital which makes for a more complex and sometimes much more difficult history. And it's hard to think of a more dramatic example of these geographies playing out in a short space of time than what even recent ancestors would have recognized as marshlands uh, at the Olympic uh, site area until relatively recently. So with this in mind, in our guide, we trace these four major currents of change. And I'll outline each theme and give you some of my, uh, give you some of my favorite examples from the trail to illustrate. But before I go on, I just want to quickly mention the intended audience. While the park attracts up to 6 million visitors a year now, most of these visitors are local people. And we were particularly keen to offer something that might interest both people that might have lived, well, have lived experience of the site, uh, but, and also newcomers, be they young people in local schools um, or colleges or universities, or those moving into the area, and to give them an easy way of understanding more about the site history and its significance. Uh, and also a way in for them to find out more um, should they need to do so. Okay, so let's start with fluid history. So this is our first theme. 
um, with, uh, with the, the blue rings, as you can see. Uh, this traces the entangled flows of people, goods, water, electricity and waste that have shaped the landscape. Here we trace the possible locations of a Roman river crossing that must have been here. We consider the crucial role of the waterways for the industrial and natural history of the area. And we learn something of the culture of the tunnelers who, as Phil has been describing, recently physically and for us metaphorically, burrowed underneath the surface of the rapidly transforming site of the Olympic Games. Now, one example from this is an, uh, is, is an article um, called Industrial Flows. And this deals with the waves of industrial development that have shaped the site. Several entries in the guide are concerned less with specific features, but these larger historical and geographical patterns. Now, in this case, Juliet Gardner explains how industrial use um, of the site began in the Middle Ages with milling, um, but the site was predominantly rural until the 18th and particularly the 19th century, when new metropolitan building regulations attracted noxious trades and chemical-based industries, alongside manufacturing and later recycling and waste management and even retail after the collapse of the docks. So in the guide, we touch on several examples from her research, tracing the 284 businesses that were forced to relocate as a result of the Olympic site development. And these 284 businesses employed nearly 5,000 people. Juliet discussed this in quite a lot of detail at an earlier event, which you can um, see the video of if you're interested uh, on the Living Maps website. So I won't go into any, any depth, but she's also published this superb book, uh, Dispersal, um, published by English Heritage, um, if, if you want to know more about that. So our next theme is encampments and other dwellings, and this looks at human habitation and homemaking from the remains of the Iron and Bronze Age village discovered within sight of, of, uh, uh, um, uh, of the aquatic centre through to prisoner of war camps, gypsy campsites and the social housing of Clays Lane housing cooperative, which Phil showed a picture of earlier or the destruction of it earlier and the allotments um, that were on the site within recent memory. Here we also touch on military encampments from prisoner of war camps going back to the First World War and an extraordinary ruined village constructed to train civil defence volunteers, which I'm sure um, uh, Johnny will be touching on a little bit later. So for me, the most resident, uh, resonant entry, uh, and this is again by Juliet Davis, is on gypsy encampments because it reminds us that it's crucially important to look beyond built structures and the built environment when you're considering the history of any area, but it's particularly the case in a, in when you have floodable common land. The Lee Valley has been associated with travelling communities for as long as five centuries. Marshlands were ideal for seasonal encampments where gypsies and travellers could park caravans, graze horses and pitch canvas tents. Much of the green space associated with these lands survived the expansion of London in the 19th and 20th centuries, but it was steadily enclosed and the enclosure of common lands uh, and various other new rules that came in governing itinerant ways of life uh, created the, concept, the, the, the context for the 1968 Caravan Sites Act, which led to designated sites for travelling groups provided by local authorities. Now, there were two uh, of these sites that were destroyed uh, by the Olympic uh, site development, one at Clays Lane, which was inhabited by Romany families, and another at Waterton Crescent, which had 20 pitches, a mixture of mobile homes and bungalows that were occupied by Irish travellers. The inhabitants were relocated uh, when the park was developed, in the case of Waterton Road, to three small sites that were more integrated with their surrounding communities. But obviously, the, the process of that divided them up uh, from 20 um, to three uh, separate uh, sites. So, you know, so it, it, it broke up that community really quite dramatically. And of course, overall, the area is almost impossible for itinerant to dwell in now, um, as it once was back in, the, back in the 19th and 20th century, although occasional use is still just about possible in the vicinity, um, camping under flyover um, arches, or indeed on the River Lee itself, where um, there are um, thousands uh, actually of houseboats along the Lee River, many of whom are officially required to move every two weeks um, for much of the year. A third theme is Edgelands remade, or made and remade. Um, and this looks at the many ways the site and its inhabitants, both human and non-human, have been transformed as it's been excavated, engineered, polluted, demolished and rebuilt. So here we consider, as the Olympic opening ceremony so dramatically portrayed, how commons used for grazing gave way to the Victorian megastructures on the sites like Stratford Railway Works and Clarnico Sweet Factory, some of the biggest industrial complexes of their age. But we also consider lesser known changes, the legacy of pollution, managing flooding, dealing with human waste and the trajectory of biodiversity. 
We also consider the, the conceptual history of the site as a borderland by policymakers, dealing with everything from sewage to industrial zoning and post-war road planning. So for this example, I'd like to take Clarnico Sweet Factory. It's a massive Victorian complex established in 1872, some of which is still in, in existence in the form of the King's Yard uh, um, buildings. But they grew to be the biggest confectionery firm um, in Britain uh, between the wars. So for this, I'm gonna show you a video. It was shot on site of the augmented reality model um, uh, which we had commissioned by Hyperactive and, and Heritage 5G. So this was a, a video that was filmed uh, um, in, in the testing phase. Um, and it just gives you a sense of what happens when you're kind of there with a mobile phone. And we've got various signs around the park with QR codes. You, you use the QR code and um, it gives you access to, uh, to this experience. In 1881, the British trade journal visited Clark, Nichols and Coombs in Hackney Wick and reflected how it was remarkable that in proportion to the advance of civilization, the demand for the luxuries of life extends, and as prosperity increases, so does the desire for these agreeable and toothsome condiments which are made to tempt, and at length we find what was once a rare treat is now a household requisite. As we look at this model of the expansive factory in the year 1900, we can think about the global connections that made Britain's national sweet tooth possible. They produced confectionaries using coconuts, ginger, licorice root, citrus fruits, and packed these sweets in tin boxes made on site. Large sugar refineries in Silvertown supplied their main ingredient using sugarcane from Fuji, the Philippines, Brazil, and Jamaica. Sri Lanka, then known as Ceylon, exported coconut, Spain provided much of the citrus, while licorice root came from the eastern Mediterranean. British Malaya supplied much of the tin imported in the later 19th century. So the local history of this site is deeply intertwined with the history of globalization in the 19th century that connected East London firms with suppliers all over the world and made it possible to mass produce sweets for the British population and to export these products around the world. Okay, so we felt that a guide like this, um, you know, should uh, should make the most of, you know, of, of some of those incredible international connections, which obviously the, the, the geographies of the docks and the Royal Docks um, and, and the Lee Valley uh, um, had. And so, you know, we were in that clip um, very strongly uh, making that point. We also felt that a guide like this could be a really great starting point for further research. So after every entry, uh, we include links to further resources and relevant archives. So, for example, for the Clarnico um, entry um, in the, the online uh, map, we include details of the firm's sweet recipe book, which you can actually go and see at Newham Archives, um, and also to oral history accounts from workers which worked at Clarnico. Um, Clarnico um, closed down relatively recently, uh, uh, um, so, so there, are, there are people alive um, that remember it. Um, and here we've, we've, we've got a lovely account of someone who remembers working in the chocolate section and um, workers would often sp spill chocolate deliberately down their aprons, take it home and then break it up uh, into chunks and give it to their kids, um, <laughs> smuggling it out uh, in that way uh, when they got home. Well, our final theme is level playing fields. This examines the changing patterns of local labour and leisure in the 19th and 20th centuries as communities struggle to improve their conditions of life, including through sport and leisure activities. On the labour front, we encounter some of the industrial disputes. Some of these were of national significance. The Match Girl strike, hugely influential on the formation of trade unions. The Pentonville Five, imprisoned for striking at Chobham Farm Container Depot, which in turn led to several industries and all the major ports in the UK being shut down in 1972. Of course, the theme of leisure can't be ignored either. From the astonishing, astonishingly successful boys club, Eaton Manor, set up to help the poor by philanthropists from Eaton School. Um, Eaton Manor established a boathouse for rowing, which is still visible on the park border. They built a sports centre, which included the acquisition of the Cinder running track used um, at the Wembley Stadium in the 1948 Olympics, uh, which was relayed here. And uh, there were uh, many, many international uh, and, and famous kind of athletes um, trained uh, trained here. And we also couldn't leave out Hackney Stadium. 
first established in 1932 as a greyhound racing track, it was familiar to gamblers nationwide as races were broadcast on television every week to betting shops all over the country when off-site gambling was legalised in 1961. The stadium had a capacity of 50,000. It was also used for other sports, including regular motorbike speedway, which attracted massive crowds. The bikes raced on a cinder track that was ideal for controlled skidding. The bikes had no brakes and just one gear and reached speeds of 70 miles an hour. The stadium had a strange demise after a massive investment by a private company that built a 12 million pound stand with cor corporate hospitality boxes in 1994. It simply couldn't make enough money and it closed just three years later in 1997. Like the vast majority of business history, we have the fall after the rise and it was demolished to make way for the broadcast centre now here east. But the social and cultural history of the stadium lives on, not just in people's memories, but also in various fantastic websites created by world experts in speedway and uh, grey greyhound racing uh, in this period. As well as the dynamic map, I should also explain you know, that we have the PDF guide, as I mentioned, but also teaching resources. Um, and these are um, aimed at 11 to 14 year olds, um, key stage three, because the park is a popular destination for school field trips. So we commissioned an experienced local teacher and field trip guide, Neil Larkin from Urban Geography East London, to devise two lesson and activity plans designed for a school group or a youth group, each of which could be carried out comfortably in a half day visit. Um, they're essentially uh, geography orientated, but they use contemporary and historical sites as case studies. So the first of these, Risk of Resilience, considers how the park site's been used to manage risk to Londoners from various threats, including flooding, disease, bombing, global warming and nuclear war. The group visits four sites in the park where pupils evaluate and debate risks and resilience. And in the process, they create their own top trumps game in which they have to figure out the risk out of 10 uh, comparatively between um, the various cards and, and after visiting the sites and, and discussing them um, they then can take away a game that they can play and uh, we've just done a pilot evaluation of this which, which went extremely well. We've also got um, a second trail uh, which this looks at environmental impacts over time and here we get the um, young people to visit two contrasting sites the aquatic centre which is just near the site of an Iron Age village and the remains of the Clarnico sweet factory that you've just seen to consider the historical geographies of human impact on the environment. So here you can see uh, a sheet, uh, basically these are, these are um, as you see them, but, with, but, but, but without the typed information and the um, after a, a discussion um, and a talk and so on, um, the young people have to, have to fill these in. Um, and they have to be obviously gonna, gonna be making kind of historical comparisons um, over time. The notes uh, and short videos and worksheets are free and they're on the website and they've been designed to be easily printed and photocopied A4 size for any school or youth group to use. Well, that brings me really to the end, I think, of, of what I want to sort of say really about, you know, practically about the kind of the content we've created. Olympic artist in residence Neville Gaby said, regeneration which wipes out or ignores the past is at best unwise. Well, needless to say, we agree wholeheartedly with that statement. An understanding of the past of this place can be immensely rewarding. The past we present is not always positive, it's not always celebratory. Like the present, it can be messy, contrary, and resist the tropes so often used by journalists when characterising this part of East London. But we hope that the map guide, trail and teaching resources give a more sophisticated understanding of the complexity of the site, enable further research for those who want to find out more, and at the very least, Later, to rest the idea that the site was little more than a blighted wasteland before the park was established. Right, I'll leave thank, it there. Thank, thank you, Toby. So, um, right. Um, now, um, so I think we'll go straight to, to Jonathan Gardner, and then we'll have uh, uh, questions uh, at the end. But please do use the, um, the chat facility uh, in the meantime, if you've got um, points that you want to, to raise, questions, um, uh, please do use that and then we'll, we'll come back to that uh, at the end. Uh, Johnny. Great. Uh, can everyone see that okay? I'm assuming yes. Um, can't see any of you for some reason now, but anyway, I, I, I hope it's 
the poem uh, showing up. So uh, yeah, I'm Jonathan Gardner. I'm a, an archeologist and heritage researcher based here uh, in Edinburgh, in Edinburgh College of Art. Uh, so I'm a kind of archeological consultant to the project, if you like. Um, and uh, sort of this, my involvement has been really with this project since about 2014. So today I'm gonna kind of talk about, well, what does a kind of archeological sensibility bring to the, the project? What does, what is archeology span for in this case? Um, so my involvement began really when um, I was carrying out PhD research at the UCL Institute of Archeology span uh, between 2012 and 2016. And um, uh, yeah, into actually not just the Olympic Park, but the, but the heritage and archeology span of mega events more broadly around London. Um, so you can see some of those here, particularly beginning with the first ever so-called mega event. So these events are kind of international in scope, um, are temporary, usually only for a few months or maybe a year at most. Um, and, and I was comparing, firstly, um, what is the history of each site before an event is built? Um, so what does the site do? Uh, what does the event do to that site and, and, and what was there before? How did it transform London materially, socially, and at a landscape level? Um, and indeed, how these, the second thing I looked at was how these events engaged with the idea of the past and, and time more generally. What is their temporal relationship? And indeed, you know, how do they create the future, often through visions of new machinery or technology at these big old festivals, ex exhibitions, or indeed with the kind of regeneration and legacy rhetoric of London 2012, as you, you may well know. And, and lastly, um, as well as demonstrating a kind of archaeological approach um, to ask what, what is left after these things are over when the circus leaves town, not to be too disrespectful, but do they leave anything? Um, and and when, when does that change from a kind of accidental legacy to a far more planned legacy? So doing this kind of cross-temporal comparison between three events really of 1851, 1951 and London 2012, as well as their legacies. So you'll see the Sydenham Crystal Palace. So the, the aftermath of the great exhibition, famously the palace rebuilt in South London, for instance, but also producing the exhibitions, uh, the, the museums of South Kensington, such as the V&A, and, and interestingly now replicated at the Olympics in the legacy of another outpost of the V&A and other cultural institutions. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my background, as I say, and my involvement and my approach to this project. Um, I'm not quite sure why this thing at the top is still showing up. Hopefully it will disappear. Um, so the, my, I should say my other background to this, and is less academic, is, is actually because I was one of the archaeologists Phil was talking about on the site back in 2007, back in 2008 as a fresh-faced 21-year-old straight out of uni who was in need of a job, um, working for the main contractors, uh, Museum of London Archaeology Service and Preconstruct Archaeology, who about a hundred of us on the site at different times during this so-called dig, demolish, design phase, um, and, and really on the myth, what was called mitigation and enabling works, so the demolition of, of buildings, the environmental cleanup, and indeed the archaeological research. So we, um, so that's actually me there recording this riverboat on under what is now West Ham Stadium's hospitality suite in December 2007. Um, and I'll come back to that boat. Yeah, we dug about 120 trenches across the site um, and around eight larger excavations, as you may see uh, some of these larger blocks, including that aquatic center roundhouse that you just saw, and another one up in Temple Mills I'll talk about as well. Um, and, 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 and not just that, the archaeology team also looked at historic buildings that were preserved, um, cottages that were in, across the site, for instance, old lock gates, that kind of thing. And this map is by the geoarchaeologists, so looking at historic and very ancient changes to the river system, for instance. That all then ended up uh, in, in a book, this book here that came out in 2012, making uh, the, by River Fields and Factories by another contractor. Um, so to some extent, we are drawing on these archaeological discoveries in this trail. Um, 
some of the things we found are, are kind of, which I won't talk about in great detail. If you want to know more about these finds, they're on, on the trail itself. As I say, today is more about the kind of methodology I bring and the kind of archaeological research that informed the groundbreakers as well. But uh, yeah, as was mentioned, the, the two pictures here are, are a rather fanciful uh, idea of what an Iron Age roundhouse looked like in the Lee Valley. So something like uh, 1500 or sorry, something like a uh, thousand BC or even five hundred BC, uh, and indeed what we found are the sort of drip gullies, um, kind of post holes which would have held up the roof. So the drip gully being around the outside, and a bit more ancient things too, a Neolithic hand axe, uh, ritually thrown in a river channel, um, and indeed a World War Two gun emplacement, which was mentioned. Um, these are the bases of the guns. Again, I'll come back to that and an old mill stream that's been the tumbling bay stream on, um, in the north of the park. So I also wanted to, I'm just going to try and get rid of this um, thing. One second, which, how do we get rid of this? It's hiding in there. Uh, okay, sorry, it's, it's not, it's not going away. Um, anyway, the, I also wanted to talk, as Phil did, about the people that built the park. Um, and uh, in this case, the archaeologists themselves. So there's another hot spot on that, if you like, within the, I think the Edgelands remade, what would the role of the archaeologists themselves was, often working very challenging conditions, very muddy, very contaminated, um, very cold at times. So you can see the respirators and rubber suits we had to wear a lot of the time. So that too is part of the history of the site that's sometimes forgotten. Um, so my approach to all of this, uh, in terms of my own research, which resulted in, in, in a PhD and, and now a book which came out recently and has now fed into the Groundbreakers Trail, really is, is what is called contemporary archaeology. So using archaeology to study the recent past or indeed the present. Um, and this is just another image of that large excavation in the north of the park. Um, uh, and I'll come back to that perhaps at this time at the end. So contemporary archaeology really is, is a broad church. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. It's interdisciplinary, but really asking how does the contemporary world uh, exist in, in the form that it is? How was it produced materially and representationally? Um, how can we use archaeological theories and methods to investigate it? Um, and, and you can do archaeology for any time period. That's something that's long been recognized in the history of archaeology. It's just until recently people didn't necessarily feel uh, that they wanted to do that or that it was accepted. But thankfully, that is now changing. And there's a large overlap and uh, credit here to anthropological material culture studies and so forth. Um, and actually, archaeology is a very powerful tool for asking about how we got to the state we're in, in some ways. It can often be quite critical. It can show material evidence for things like conflict and human rights and documentary sources. Uh, have missed or have been intentionally destroyed and, and indeed it asks questions which are familiar to critical heritage studies of how archaeology and archaeologists themselves produce narratives about the past and that's certainly something you know in the Olympic Park we were doing our work was used immediately hoovered up by the Olympic Delivery Authority's PR team to give a nice good news story um, and, and we very often had very little control over the stories that were told about what we were finding. So it was a politically active actor, if you like, archaeology too, within this construction and demolition process as well. So, and, you know, without kind of going into huge theoretical arguments here, but contemporary archaeology is particularly interested in this idea that Phil has hinted at heterotemporality, how the past and present and future intersect and how we as archaeologists and, and others assemble that, um, assemble narratives in the present from the scraps of the past, if you like, uh, drawing on, on, on kind of, again, Walter Benjamin's ideas, particularly this idea of a dialectical image where there's a kind of in this conscious assembling of drawing together scraps or fragments of the past into the present. There's a moment of recognition, a juxtaposition in the now and, and really what he called dialectics at a standstill um, and, and with, a, with an idea that in this moment of recognition we can make changes, we can say that the, the now has a, has a history, the present has this past 
um, that is not necessarily, it's not, it wasn't the only way history could have gone, to put it simply. So, but archaeologists like uh, Shannon Doddy have extend, extended this into the process of archaeological excavation, literally, whereas Benjamin was using it as a metaphor or an analogy, sometimes it has been used by archaeologists really to understand uh, situations of social inequality in the present, for instance. So, and, and the idea is that we are not digging up the past as it was. We are digging up remnants that indeed were produced in a time in the past, which is now indeed past. Um, but these fragments, we are making narratives about the past now in the present. So then the act of assembling these narratives has a, obviously a very strongly political edge, even whether we like, like it or not. People will often deny that. But archaeology indeed is not a neutral act and it, I don't see how it ever could be. We have to interpret uh, the past in the present ultimately and often with a view to the future and hence is the kind of crux of the, the idea of heritage itself. So my approach in this research phase, if you like, for the project was to kind of think about how these giant spectacles, these mega events, particularly in this case London 2012, created its own history and heritage, created a narrative about itself and indeed how the materials of the past and the people that interacted with the materials and landscapes made them, used them, destroyed them, um, were not uh, always represented equally and, and how the past is often very uh, contested and how there's often multiple interpretations. Nothing new really in, talk, in terms of public history or heritage here, but, but just to say that there are there are more than the official meanings. There are more than the PR spiel about uh, archaeology in the park, for instance. And part of this was also my own involvement as an archaeologist working here. I felt somehow implicated in that we told only part of the story of this place. We potentially fed into this industrial wasteland narrative inadvertently. So I was quite keen to, as part of this project, my wider research to challenge some of that, just as the others have been discussing. In more practical terms, this involved me doing a lot of different kinds of methods, some traditional archaeology in terms of field work, walking and photography, not much excavation. Uh, they were already building the Olympic Park when I started, or it was already finished, so they weren't going to let me dig it up again. But indeed, drawing on the archives of the original archaeological excavations and, and grey literature, so unpublished reports, uh, and that helped me drill down into specific sites I was interested in. And then uh, a lot of kind of map regression and looking at old plans and, and referencing things, putting things together, a kind of literal layering of maps sometimes and, and aerial photography combined with, with other more kind of niche records, I suppose. So things like planning documentation that have to be submitted for building the Olympics and indeed for buildings that were submitted uh, on the historic planning registers, many of which have been digitized and are online really back to the 1960s. Um, and indeed going into archives proper, like the London Metropolitan Archives, to find out specific things about, say, the Pudding Mill River, how it was changed, or, or you know, something like that. Um, and in some ways, this was about a kind of basic characterization of land. And then this enabled me to feed into the others. You know, I think this is an interesting site for this theme of safe fluid histories or Edlands remade, etc. Some extent we could think about you know this is something that everyone who charts this area has done this is from 1800 this is thomas milne's map but you know even he back in in this ancient well not ancient but 200 odd years ago he marked the different squares of land with different uses so m for meadows and ma for marsh in this case um and and indeed this little circle is really right where the velodrome is now um and Chobham Manor is still called Chobham Manor. So that's what I kind of did, practically speaking. Um, and I was often really interested in kind of hidden stories, hidden histories, and particularly as an archaeologist, ones that we have material evidence for, or at least proxies for that material, um, how landscapes transformed over time. Let's look at some themes. Um, here's the fluid histories, which you saw already. Let's talk about one of my favorites and one of the sites I excavated as an archaeologist, the Pudding Mill boat and indeed the Pudding Mill River itself, um, which I've written about in, in different formats. But um, so this, as, as Toby said, this idea is about flows of water in particular, but also of materials and people and ideas. Um, so the Pudding Mill River, 
it used to run really right under the stadium and the boat was found at the mouth of one of its former channels or one of the, the one of the original courses of that um and we picked this because i think the pudding mill river and its boat are very evocative everybody likes a kind of buried boat um i i would imagine it's quite unusual but there's still a place called pudding mill there's the, the dlr station there's going to be a new neighborhood so to some extent there is a still a continuing resonance despite the river itself being long gone and obviously in london there's a very in long history of people being interested in so-called lost rivers so this is the pudding mill river back in 2007 uh, what it used to look like it wasn't insubstantial um uh, and actually to build the stadium the london stadium the olympic stadium this was completely filled in so it isn't lost it is effectively destroyed it isn't a culvert during a pipe like the river fleet for instance and you can see here in 2007 the beginnings of that process of filling uh, right at the stadium uh, would be i think on the right hand side of this image uh, today um we can look at you know i i to, start telling the story of this hidden river we, we started to look at older maps you can see it there again we still have the city river we still have the river Lee. we still have waterworks river or admittedly changed but, uh, the, the, the stadium again being kind of somewhere around here um this is again an early 19th century map um, so really just kind of trying to work out where it was in some cases and going on the archaeological reports uh, you can see how it's it's changed through time. Um, you can see this up at the, uh, it's actually quite in this green outline. It's it's quite winding up here is where we find the boat stadium is here. And this is I think in, in the 1860s, so not much industry. We move on into the 1890s. Uh, you start to see uh, things getting more industrialized. So the the story of the river becomes a story of industrial Stratford too, and indeed into the the, the 19 into the early 20th century um we start to see significant changes and by 1930 and since this the mouth of the river being changed hence the boats ended up in this little filled in channel there um, and increasingly the river itself being infilled as we get to the nine the late 20th century until today you can see it uh, there so and I also kind of put together other kind of less accurate maps, I suppose, or at least more detailed maps. We see one of those businesses that Juliet talked about, the, the colonizing business, the boat was found in this little uh, yard here, and the Pudding Mill River runs down there. So north is, is kind of over here, and the stadium today is where it says hunting. So back to this, really, the boat itself is this kind of the most famous object probably of the archaeological excavations is on the front cover of the books as you saw um and again much of what we did was distilling that kind of complicated archaeological story into that small snippet for the for the groundbreakers trail but also providing extra information itself but also saying um this is something that you can okay you can't visit the boat itself unfortunately but we you can visit exactly where it's found um uh, and also the fact that this was part of a much longer history as i say this is the galvanizing plant and it ties in it isn't separate from these there's a long kind of durée of history here and indeed you can walk to the site now this is the pudding mill river as infilled today just on as i say next to that hospitality suite it doesn't run the big copper down here but it is there you can see the old entrance you can see where that footage used to be that the sign was on I took earlier. Um, so let's look at another example uh, back to kind of defending London. This was another favorite of mine. And, and again, a complex story to distill even into this quite long text. Um, I can just kind of look at the archeological reports of uh, this is the kind of guns that would have been there four and a half inch, or sorry, three and 3.7 inch guns, which then got upgraded later in the war. This is uh, a, a similar one in Richmond Park. And that also if, uh, was the, one of the issues that I think Toby will agree with. The images are so important for something like this. And if we don't have them, which we didn't for this, we have to find good alternatives. So thankfully there is a very similar example here. And there's another in Mudshoot even to this day. Um, the archeologists excavated part of the gun site. So this is, from the report uh, of that time 
And you can see it there in the aerial photograph partially excavated and including these nice steel helmets they found there. The archaeologists, however, seem to have missed things. Uh, I, I must admit I was not part of this excavation, but um, because they talked about it as a purely Second World War site, but actually what research for this project and my own research has shown is that this site had a very long afterlife. It's actually more heavily used after the war as a, as a civil war uh, defence training ground. So these helmets actually are more likely to be from its period from 1953 to 1968. Now what this was, uh, was, was a, as Toby mentioned, um, a site for res practising at rescuing people from London being bombed by nuclear weapons. Amazing as that might sound, or ludicrous as that might sound, um, the, the gun pits, some of the original walls you can see here and in the background here, so these octagonal buildings on the plan, were repurposed they built about 20 different ruined structures, intentional ruins, as it were, in some cases reusing blitz materials, uh, where they could practice, the rescue teams could practice uh, bringing people out of buildings uh, should the worst happen. So should London be bombed by the USSR, uh, by nuclear weapons? Um, and increasingly after the, the H-bomb was developed in the mid-1950s, uh, the core were seen as kind of outdated and, and really the chances of being able to rescue anyone or let alone get close were seen as, as kind of minimal. So by 1968, the, the organization was uh, abolished, but it was extremely popular. There was 250,000 volunteers in this organization across the UK at the time, and they were constantly training, but it was actually quite open. It wasn't a military organization. It was a civilian one, so they had open days, they had competitions. So this is really a piece of hidden history that until my research uh, had been all but forgotten seemingly on this site. You can see some of the plans from the Metropolitan Archives there, really beautiful ar architectural sections and um, of, of like the intentionally ruined factory there, for instance. Um, and I, you know, I tried to find out what happened to it afterwards. By the 1970s, the Lee Valley Park was formed and they seemed to have dumped a lot of earth on it. Um, and we have just before the games in 2007, quite a nice photograph showing some of the allotments we mentioned, and in the north of the site, uh, the, the civil defense ground, there's Clay's Lane, there's the coal there's where the 1972 strike was, it was mentioned, and indeed the old Eastway cycle circuit. So this has really radically changed over time. The north switches around, but this is it today. Um, so the velodrome is just off screen here to the east, so north is at the bottom of this image. Um, and much of this area is, is where that excavation took place. And you can see the famous Olympic rings there. But again, the idea of including this kind of hidden history is, yes, there's nothing to see on the ground, but it gives you a sense that this place was at the center of things. It firstly defending London from being bombed uh, in the Second World War, and then really quite a, you know, an altruistic and um, brave endeavor as people willing to go into nuclear bombed out buildings would have practiced here and and really an interesting history to the site for people to discover as they walk around I think. Um, probably stop after this one given the time but in, in Edgeland's remains I, I really like this theme because this 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 groundbreakers this idea of literally breaking into the ground or tunneling through it as as Phil so evocatively described earlier is, is so crucial to this it has been changed and rebuilt and remodeled so many times and no doubt will continue to be. Um, and I think for this one I was keen to write a point, a hotspot as we called them, on, on what you can actually see of the past year materially, literally let's go out and find some stuff. We can't dig up the part but some of it has been reused. So this is what I called remnants and traces um, and as you can see in this picture, if you go to any of the bridges of the Olympic Park and you look into these massive steel gabions, which are kind of mass filled to, to keep the bridges in place, I guess, um, it, within them is, is crushed concrete, sometimes crushed brick, crushed glass bricks, and even bits of granite sets and cobblestones. Um, and that what this is, is actually the crushed up remains of all the buildings and the roads and the infrastructure of the site before, as it was knocked down, it was reprocessed and reused. Um, and to kind of find out more about this, I had to look into some kind of interesting, you know, contractors documentation, there's a report on how this was done, the statistics, there's examples of how materials were reused and why and where. Um, 
which is kind of super technical, but really, really interesting. And what this was about was because um, as part of its commitment to be the greenest ever games, building London 2012, they ended up recycling or reusing 98% of the materials of the demolition um, of the rebuilding of the park. And that included the soil. So you, you, the Olympic rings is, for example, on these other hills, that's all clean soil, which was quite contaminated, something like 3 million tons, I think. Um, so it's all still here. Uh, it's just completely transformed, transfigured, if you like. Um, in other cases, we find out more about, say, that site of the Pudding Mill River. There's a, there's, you can dig into freedom of information requests. Somebody put in what went into the Pudding Mill River. It turns out nine and a half thousand cubic meters of soil from the stadium site, uh, which was slightly contaminated, um, was put into that. We can look at planning records from the planning portal, all of which are still online. So we can do a kind of archaeology of the planning process all this. So all of that has fed in to my research and indeed there it is there's the you can see the gabion there and you can see this so these traces exist in the park if you know where to look here are some of the the curb stones which were um excavated from that large road i showed you earlier on buried under a landfill site here's some of the reused granite sets uh, on the greenway um, up above the park so i've got one more of these but i think i'm going to skip over it but you know that sometimes quite interesting the places you can find material for instance this is the trade union Con congress library collections you wouldn't know it now in the olympic village in chobham manor very nice housing and new park lands but again this is a really significant site for industrial labor in 1972 of the of the chobham farm cold store strike an act of secondary pick picketing by dock workers obviously very relevant for our current situation potentially but i will kind of I'll skip through that it was obviously to do with the containerization and the gradual decline of London's docks. Um, again, I'm going to fly through that just so we have more time for discussion. You can see how much the area has changed. This is it on the left today, and this is it really only in 1995. So the amount of rail lines, the amount of factories and warehouses, there's that Speedway Stadium there. Um, so again, maps are, given that we're a living maps talk, maps are so crucial to this process. Um, and I'll skip over that. So I wanted to end also with Neville Baby. Not, and I, I was, Toby's used the same quote as me, so I'm not going to use that. But I think this idea of ignoring the past is, is indeed something that Neville got right as, in, as a kind of um, artist in residence during the games. And, you know, I wanted to focus on this image he put together um, as part of his residency. Um, and in this, he was interested in how past and present often conflicted or, or at least meshed up against each other in the Olympic Park. So here he's intentionally created this image freeze frame to look like Georges uh, Surat's famous bathers at Asnye uh, of, of, I can't remember the date, of the late 19th century, um, which you'll probably know by image of not the name. And, and obviously there's a Parisian suburb on a rapidly industrializing periphery. You see the factories in the background. And, and actually, rather than he, he then released the, this image in, in the Metro at the time in 2012 in the newspaper. And actually, he said he found it interesting that the CGI representations of the future that many of which we've seen today reminded him of this older image. And actually, then he kind of had this weird idea of recreating an older image based on CGI, although this is very much real, took a lot of effort to organize. But he says in, in his book on this, he said here, you know, the original image of France embracing the Republic, an urban public park populated by workers, factories in the background, the economic drivers of the 19th century. Compare that to a post-industrial landscape using sport and leisure to reinvent itself, described as a new park for the people in East London. The implication, I think, being, you know, what what happens, you know, when, when something so well known for industry and so well known for this kind of dirty past, if you like, um, is completely reimagined into something completely new. It is a very new frontier for this area, but it is important to not lose that kind of depth of history and those embrace, you know, I think we should be embracing these tensions between the past and the present. And, and this idea that it was a wasteland is a way of erasing that tension or that complication or nuance of history, I think. And I think the Groundbreakers has been such a powerful force to kind of complicate history, if you like, in a, in, a, in a playful way sometimes, and in quite a critical way at other times. 
And I think that's something that this area and indeed the whole of London really benefits from. Rather than saying, this is history, that's the end of the story. There are many histories, there are many people, there are many materials. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, I should say, if you want to know more, obviously look at the Groundbreakers website. Um, I have now written a book about all this, which is free to download from UCL Press or indeed purchase for a low price. Um, and that covers a lot of what I've said today, but not just the Olympic site, uh, all of the sites of the mega events of London. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much so much, uh, uh, Johnny, for that. Uh, well, I'm conscious we, we've overrun our time, um, but I hope those that have stayed with us have uh, you know, felt that they've got you know, at least some uh, more in-depth understanding of, of, of the issues we, we had to work through uh, practically as well as conceptually in, in putting this project together. And I have to say, I think, I mean, it's it's quite unusual these days that a, that a bunch of fairly kind of radical left, left field kind of people get together and get to actually uh, tell a story about a major um, international um, tourists and visitor sites and these days you know a, a lot of people who could do that are kind of marginalized and are not allowed to um, you know to actually you know, make their mark on these sites and I think one of the one of the things we managed to achieve I mean with some support from the London Legacy Development Corporation obviously with uh, also support from the, the Heritage uh, Lottery Fund and um, Foundation for Future London that basically um, provided money to allow us to, to complete this project which took over ne nearly 10 years because we had various ups and downs on the way but nevertheless um i think in terms of you know a legacy we we, ha we have put in place um you know uh, the trail and the guide which i mean as, as john and toby both emphasized in different ways i mean do put in question the sort of dominant narratives of this place um but also the dominant narratives of, of regeneration uh, more generally. So, uh, you know, so we feel it was, from our point of view, it was worth um, staying with it. And um, thank all of you for staying with it uh, through this presentation. Now, we have a sh short amount of time left. Um, so, you know, if there are any people who want, you know, have some questions, points they want to make, um, whatever. So please, um, uh, I've look, I've checked the, uh, the chat. I, can't see actual too many questions there, but uh, please, if anyone here has either either a point of information or or some point they want to raise, um, speak now or forever hold your peace, as they say. Anyone burning to say something? Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Mm, yeah. Um, if I was to go to the Olympic Park, is there any of the living maps um, research uh, available or like on display? Toby, do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, yes, there is. Uh, basically, uh, the Information Centre um, has a lot of kind of postcards um, advertised on the website. Um, and also um, the Park Authority has distributed those piles of postcards to quite a few key sites like the Aquatic Centre and Timber Lodge Cafe and places like that. Um, so we, 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 you know, we wanted to get, get word out that way. Um, but probably most importantly, there, there are nine signs in the park itself. Um, and there's one by the Olympic Bell, there's one by um, well, you know, uh, the, uh, the Carnico uh, factory site, for example, um, but there's, there, there's seven others. Um, and so, so they advertise the Living Maps website, and also there's a QR code there for the augmented reality experience too. Um, so we tried, although they're, they're kind of A3, they're not massive, they're kind of A3 size, quite hard to spot, they're kind of pink, but you know, but they just went up uh, about uh, three weeks ago. So uh, if you go to the site, you will see those. Um, uh, yeah, so please just kind of get the word out really. Obviously, you know, it's the, all of this material is online, it's free and, um, uh, and it does work on a mobile device. So. Um, okay, uh, great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I also meant to say that was really fascinating and interesting talk, so thanks. That's yeah. great, Charlotte. So pleased you could join us. <laughs> Toby, I was, uh, are the, the location of these QR codes, are they on any map? Yeah, that? so uh, on the, um, if you go to the resources section uh, of the website, uh, I've, put, I've put the link to it in the chat, by the way. Um, 
under resources, it's got AR Trail, and in that little section, you can click. There's a, a downloadable leaflet with a map with the QR codes. But I've also uh, I have now put a link to a Google Map, and that Google Map has direct links to those augmented reality experiences. So you can, in fact, do it at home. You don't have to go to the park. So if you if you want to sort of check those out, you can. Obviously, you know, the, the whole point of it is that it's place based and it, it's lovely if you can do that, but you know, but obviously not everyone can get to the park. Um, and if you say so if you'd like to, to, to do it, you can. Um, the what happens is the QR code takes you to well, initially we were gonna actually gonna have an app that you had to download, but um we after a bit of user testing realized that that's kind of a bit too much of an ask for, for a lot of people. So the QR code takes you straight to um a an augmented reality site and so as you can see you get the, the actual background and then you have the model or, or you know whatever image or whatever kind of superimposed in front of you uh, when you use it just bear in mind there's usually a play button and you have to kind of move the move the camera around to find to find the buttons and the button's kind of floating around you've got to find it and press play uh, otherwise you won't hear the audio commentary so and also the the buttons are black and that doesn't work terribly well against dark backgrounds so we need to kind of, you know, make some suggestions to the, you know, to, uh, to, to the platform that we're using that that, that that perhaps that could be addressed. But, but no, but it does kind of work. And um, one of the issues with any augmented reality or, or phone-based thing uh, is, is is kind of making sure that it can last, you know, last for sort of three or four years. And these things are so fast moving. But I think we found a platform, you know, it works on. 95 percent of mobile phone kind of browsers and, and it, it's just it just works on a web browser you don't need to download the whole app the other thing to say is that there is free wi-fi throughout the entire park so um you, if you connect to the wi-fi you don't you don't have to bother with data which uh, you know, usually for people in this country it's not a problem but if you're from a different country then data can be expensive i think it's worth you know sometimes you know the the, the ar trail is is kind of an part of our our map that Toby has demonstrated, but also separate if you if you see what I mean. So it's a kind of very much on the ground resource, whereas our our groundbreakers trail, which Toby clicked through in the different fluid histories and edge lands, is is designed so you can use it at home if you want. But you could equally it works very well on a phone. So if you're in the park, you can look at uh, on there as well. Or if you if you want to keep it simple, you can download the PDF and just read it, you know. Uh, so it's, it's it's kind of in that sense it's quite a flexible resource. Um, I was going to say, Phil, I found out recently about your, your images of the TVMs, of the tunneling machines. Um, the, one of them was called Helen, apparently. They always have women's names. Yes, they have women's uh, names, yes. Um, and uh, I, for some, I can't remember why. It was one of those random FY requests or emails I sent a couple of years ago. But I was in touch with Murphy, the company, the contractor who was running them. And I asked, well, what happened to all these TVMs after the games because you know when they build the you know cross rail or some of the tube lines sometimes they just drive them into the earth because they're too expensive to remove in this case because they were small apparently they were removed and cleaned up to be reused and tbm helen uh god rest her soul uh was used to dig a tunnel under the river ribble uh, i think that's like Mer merseyside isn't it and but it got stuck in the mud and flooded and the, the tunnel had to be abandoned. So, so actually one of the Olympic TBMs is now an archaeological artifact halfway under the River Ribble, which is quite a strange thing. So it's a kind of, yeah, an echo of your, of your ethnic ethnography, yeah. perhaps. I don't know. But I find that, I find that fascinating recently, but it's, it's great to see more about your, your work. Well, it's, it's, there were two machines. One was called Helen, another one was called Sonia. All oh, right. Uh, uh, they, I mean, it's very interesting because obviously you, know, you think time tunnel is a very macho uh, culture, which in some ways it is. Uh, you know, that kind of manual, heavy manual work culture. But um, actually, um, they attributed various uh, feminine characteristics to these machines. I mean, Sonia was, was seen to be um, kind of quite capricious and unreliable, um, and uh, um, Helen was seen to be. Uh, set more on track um i don't know i mean there's all sorts of things to project i mean it's some history of that of kind of you know machines being uh, given given uh, often quite sexist names but i think the fact is that that they had a, as, as i saw some of the, the quotes these these workers actually had a, a good deal of respect um 
well, both for the machines and for the and for for the earth and for you know they often they're sort of portrayed as sort of um, I don't know dinosaurs you know miners and tunnels and whatever but actually actually um, their view of the environment uh, and how human beings should relate uh, both to machines and the environment I think in this case certainly was really quite progressive. I mean, you know, this was this was 2000 and, and, and 2008. Um, of course, there was an environmental movement. I mean, they weren't actually part, actually, you know, joined these groups, but their actual perceptions of the land, of the earth, of, of the soil, uh, seemed to me to, to actually contain the elements of really quite a progressive attitude, uh, you know, uh, so I think that that was something that, I, that surprised me, actually. The thing about ethnography is that you're continually surprised by, you know, what people do, what people think, what people say. And as, as you pointed out, uh, Johnny, it, it's, it's often very different from the kind of stereotypical kinds of perceptions and stories that are kind of attached either to the place or the people. So... So I think that's one thing we have been able to do from our different perspectives, from you know Toby's perspective, Juliet's, uh, and also we did mention uh, Bob Gilbert, who gives, gives you know, some very important input into our understanding of the kind of fauna and flora of the site, and as active players in, in the making of the landscape. So um, all I can say is, it's, from my point of view, I've learned an awful lot uh, from you guys. And as Toby said, there are also very large numbers of people who in different ways have made inputs into this into this project, um, and I'm only sorry, really, that because of some you know, financial difficulties we had, some of the work, including work done by children and young people um, on, uh, on the site, uh, we couldn't actually um, make that much use of. But um, we, we we don't know quite what the next step is. If there is a next step, but um, uh, as uh, I think everyone said, I mean, this is not the end of the story. Um, you know, that, um, that there's 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 more work to be done, I think. Whether we do or not, I don't know. But uh, certainly, I hope that at least people who come across the project, mm. it'll, it'll encourage them to kind of ask questions and say, "Well, what about that? How about that?" Or maybe we think about it that way. I, I think, yeah, that's so true. And I think it's had one of the biggest achievements that, that you and Toby have made from this is actually getting the. The London Legacy Development Corporation to care about heritage. I think without without groundbreakers, I mean, I mean, I know I know that one individual joined the organisation and really did change things and was much more interested. But I think the project has been instrumental in getting the London Legacy Development Corporation to kind of start to put it much more centrally in their plans for the park. I've seen they've they've now put up their own heritage interpretation signs about the Olympic rings and the Olympic buildings as a kind of heritage trail of their own. So I think that's a really positive thing that's happened in the last couple of years, for sure. Um, and indeed, yeah, as Toby says, the kind of, um, yeah, there's, there's also kind of more ad hoc approaches. We are not the only ones um, documenting this site, but it, it's great to see the interest in the area. So, Yeah, that's a good point, Johnny. You know, and, and I, I think, you know, um, just, you know, you were saying how important, you know, internet kind of web, web research has been but, no, but also for some of the cultural and social history, I mean, some of some of the websites that people have created, well, I've just put a link in to one called uh, Parkopedia, and it's just, it's got the most amazing array of information there. And, you know, these are just um, sort of created by people that feel very passionately about, you know, a, a subject or an area or whatever. And um, it's just, you know, it's just enormously useful. And you know, clearly, you know, you've got to check sources and, and, and so on. And, and But... Um, um, just to say, you know, what what a revolution! Just you know, even sort of twenty years ago, you know, you'd be you'd be in the archive, right, looking at you know <laughs> sort of mostly printed maps and and sort of trawling through, you know, trying to find references to, to particularly to kind of things like gypsy, you know, culture or whatever. It's just not going to be in there. So so um, it just makes makes our job so much easier now. And um, so yeah, just a, just a shout out to all the, all the people that are doing that kind of work. It's just just amazing. Right. Well, um, unless somebody has, has you know, something that you know, want to, want to add or throw in, I mean, uh, please do visit the Living Maps website, as um, Toby and, uh, and Johnny have uh, stressed, and uh, check out the guide and, and visit the park. 
Um, and if you want to send us some feedback, um, you can always um, uh, put in a place where you can contact us, and uh, we'd love to hear from you, especially if you know if you if you try the trail. Um, uh, so I'll put in I'll put in a, our our webs now I'll put in a or you can email us. Um, and yeah, we'd love to hear from you uh, if you have any comments, feedback, whatever. And also, uh, thought just to say, uh, people can sign up to, to, to the, the, the Living Maps email list, and uh, there's plenty more events throughout the year. So um, if you go to the website, and you'll be able to find that. Perhaps we could stick the link in the chat as well. Oh yes, I'll do, I'll do that. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, it's the end of a very long journey for us. <laughs> this, um, and as I said, I mean, you know. It's it's not it's not the not the end of the story. It's the end of probably perhaps of our our direct, our direct involvement. But anyway, I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved in this over this period. Um, and uh, you know, just just thanks. And uh, we hope we hope that what we've done will be of some interest, pro provocation, um, and so on. And uh, you know, the story continues. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. And to you both as well. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye, all. Bye.